in the second half of the urinary system, we're going to focus on, now that we've learned about the different structures that are involved um, within the urinary system, and there really aren't that many, but we can focus on the process of urine formation and how the kidneys actually act as a regulatory mechanism within our bodies, and also the process of urination, and then look at the different structures of um, the different components, including the kidney, as well as the nephron. All right, so let's first talk about urine formation. Urine formation happens in three steps. The first step is filtration. So first thing we do is we filter the body, or filter the blood in the body, and we basically push everything out of um, the blood. Then we get reabsorption of the things that we need or we want back into the blood. And then finally, secretion, where we actually purposely put certain components into the blood so that it can be uh, taken out via the urine. So um, a lot of the process of urine formation is controlled by the posterior pituitary gland and the hormone ADH. And that's simply because um, you know, a lot of our urine is made up of water. So um, to have the uh, antidiuretic hormone is going to dictate what percentage of water is actually located within the urine itself. Okay, so in the first step of filtration, like I said earlier, basically um, we take the blood and we, we filter it in the glomerulus of the nephron. Um, this happens in the Bowman's capsule, but remember inside of there we have the high pressure capillary that um, actually squeezes, it basically wrings it out almost like a sponge. At that point then, so this is within the renal corpuscles, so the combination of the glomerulus and the um, Bowman's capsule. Um, so the blood flowing through the glomerulus exerts enough pressure to push all the water and the dissolved substances out into the Bowman's capsule, which is basically like a collecting cup around this capillary. Um, so it, it would be like if you, you took a sponge and wrung it out, like I said, but you were doing it over a cup. So just to give you an idea of how much gets pushed out, we empty about 125 milliliters every minute out of the blood. Now, obviously, if we have just under a gallon, four to six liters, that's four to 6,000 uh, milliliters of blood volume. If everything got squeezed out of the blood and didn't have anything come back, we'd run out of fluid very, very quickly. So obviously that doesn't happen, but it also tells you about how effectively uh, the filtration takes place. So in an ideal world, if we didn't reabsorb anything, we would actually produce about 180 liters of urine a day. Now, obviously, if we were producing that much, imagine 92 liter bottles, like go to the grocery store and sometime and count 92 liter bottles of soda. Um, you would probably spend all day, every day, on the toilet in order to get rid of 180 liters of urine in a day. So since we don't do that, there has to be something uh, that's going on to actually get some of those, some of that uh, urine back into the blood, and that is the process of reabsorption. Basically the idea with reabsorption is we get take the good stuff that our body wants and we try to get it back into the blood. So what happens is we actually move substances out of the renal tubules and into the blood capillary. So we're actually kind of pushing these things back into the blood as the blood continues to circulate around the nephron and the renal tubules. Um, the things that go back into the blood are things like water, glucose, other ions like calcium and sodium, and certain other nutrients. Um, glucose is one that has to go back into the blood. We don't want to see any sugar, any glucose in our um, urine. It's an indication um, of one of the different types of diabetes, um, and it's called glycosuria. And that's one of the things that they do when they actually test your urine is they look for that glucose uh, because that is a sign that you have a kidney problem um, and a form of diabetes. 
just to give you an idea, 99% of the water that gets pushed out in urine formation is reabsorbed. So we go from producing 178 liters of urine, uh, or 180 liters of urine, to reabsorbing 178. So of those 92 liter bottles in a given day, we only ever really get rid of about one. So that, that gives you kind of an idea in terms of the, the percentage that gets stuck back into the body. Like I said before, 100% of the glucose has to be reabsorbed because um, otherwise it's, a, it's an indication of disease. Now, only a portion of certain other ions are going to get reabsorbed, and that includes sodium. Um, it, and a lot of that is going to depend on your salt intake. So uh, a lot of times doctors will actually look at the amount of sodium that you're um, eliminating through your urine to see if maybe your sodium intake is too high. Now, so once I've filtered the blood, so pushed everything out and reabsorbed back in, what do I want? Um, then I also still need to push some other things in there and kind of force it to go in at the very end. And that's the process of secretion. This is where the urine is secreted into the collecting tubule. So substances are going to move from the blood into the distal convoluted tubule as well as the collecting tubules from the blood in the capillary. So it has this capillary net that lies over the nephron and it's going to push these substances out of the blood and into the urine. So this includes things like hydrogen ions um, and this is going to, if you remember from your chemistry, hydrogen ions dictate pH, that's what our pH scale is based off of, um, potassium ions, certain drugs are also secreted through the urine and ammonia and the combination of these substances will differ based on your own body's acid base balance because that's what these secretion substances do is they help to maintain those and this is a necessary step because not all of the dissolved materials are forced into the fluid that gets drained into the Bowman's capsule by filtration so when I actually form urine, what am I regulating? So the kidneys are an important regulatory organ in our body. They're one of the most important, simply because you know once we lose something from the body, we can't get it back, and the kidneys definitely control one of those components. The first one, and probably the most obvious, is the fluid balance. Um, basically, it makes the amount of water you take in each day equal to the amount that you lose, or um, you know, hopefully under ideal circumstances, that's what would be happening. All right, sorry about that. I just got a little interruption. All right, so the idea is that all the, the you know, the amount that you lose in urine should be amount that you take in. Um, you know, obviously in certain circumstances, that's not always the case. Um, water volume is about 99% of our fluid volume inside of our cells. So um, we need to make sure that the water levels stay at the right balance because if the water levels decline too far, your cell activities are jeopardized and the cell can die. Um, what can happen is the cell can actually shrivel up as you lose that fluid volume. Um, that's what happens when you dehydrate. Your, your cells actually do start to shrivel and they can start dying. If enough of those cells start dying, you can have organ failure and death as a result, which aren't very fun. The second thing that's regulated by the kidneys is your electrolyte balance. Now, this occurs when you get no net gain or loss of any ion in your fluids. So in other words, um, you want to make sure that you have the proper amount of like calcium and sodium um, for things like nerve firing and muscle contractions, um, and that's what the electrolyte balance is all about. The ion concentration is very important to the proper functioning of many of our systems. Um, so we have to, the kidneys have to monitor the rates of absorption in the digestive tract and the rates of loss in the kidneys. So if I eat a lot of foods that cause my digestive tract to absorb a lot of calcium, my kidneys actually have to um, get rid of some of that if we can't store it um, because we need to maintain that balance. 
too high of levels of some of these is, is very dangerous, like sodium and potassium. We want to make sure that we keep things in the proper levels. Now, those two things you probably could have guessed if I had given you the opportunity to in terms of things that the kidneys regulate because those are things that are pretty well known. One of the lesser known things though that kidneys and the process of urine formation regulates is our acid-base balance. Now the acid-base balance occurs when the production of H+, which is that acid ion, is equal to the loss. Now what this acid-base balance does is it keeps the pH of our body fluids within the normal range that we need. This is regulated by a combination of the kidney as well as the lungs. Now you remember the lungs actually monitor this because they are involved with the um, removal of that carbonic acid from the blood. And the kidney monitors specifically the H+. Low pH is especially dangerous because that is the one that will denature our proteins and our enzymes. And basically, for those of you who don't remember what denaturing is, that's when the, the, the enzyme and the substrate actually fit together like that lock and key mechanism. The shape of the key has to match the shape of the lock. Well, if I take my key and I melt it, I change its shape. It's still the same substance, but it doesn't work anymore. So that's what happens when you denature an enzyme, and you can't ever get it back. Um, so pH, temperature will do it like with the melting of the key, but pH will also do that as well. It will change that shape so it doesn't work anymore. Um, if you denature the wrong enzymes, you can actually put your life at risk. Um, because you know certain processes aren't going to take place fast enough in order for you to live. So the lungs are going to remove the carbonic acid from our blood and the kidneys add or remove both H plus as well as bicarbonate to help maintain the balance. H plus decreases the pH and the bicarbonate that they add actually uh, increases it so it takes it a little bit more towards the base side. Now the last process we want to look at before we get to our diagrams is the process of micturition. Micturition is, is basically the fancy medical term for urination or voiding. Now this is actually controlled by two sets of sphincter muscles. There is an external set which is more towards the outside of the body and those are our voluntary ones. These are the ones that we have to learn to control as children when we get potty trained. The internal ones are the involuntary ones. We never get control of those. So these muscles, when they are contracted, the, the, the urethra, which leads from the urinary bladder to the outside of the body, is closed off. It is pinched off. So that keeps the urine within the bladder. The process itself of micturition is initiated by a stretch reflex. As the bladder fills, it stretches. And when it gets to a certain stretch point, um, when the bladder volume reaches about 350 milliliters, um, we start to get that signal to our brain that we need to go to the bathroom. Um, and this is a reflex. This is something that um, actually you know, we don't have any control over, and it happens automatically every time. Now, obviously, since we control that external sphincter muscle, that doesn't mean that when we get that stretch reflex, we automatically go to the bathroom, because we don't. Um, you know, but that's when our brain starts receiving that signal. When we do actually undergo the process of micturition, the bladder wall contracts. Okay, so it's going to contract down and kind of push down on the urine inside. The internal sphincter is going to relax, and then the external sphincter is going to relax to allow the urine to escape into the urethra. And then that's it. So it's a pretty simple process. Contraction, relaxation of one, relaxation of the other, the urine can escape. Now, we can have um, three different problems with the process of micturition. The first one is called urinary retention. This is when the urine is produced, 
but it does not void. In other words, it's never eliminated from the body. And while fresh urine is sterile, if I continue to keep that urine in the bladder, I actually will develop with the bacteria that are present a bladder infection. Um, so that could require surgery or um, some sort of medical intervention. The second problem is urine suppression. This is where our bladder is normal, but for whatever reason, no urine is formed. This causes a condition called uremia. Basically, the uh, levels of the uric acid, which is our metabolic byproduct that we're trying to filter out, um, actually reach toxic levels within the blood. For whatever reason, the filtration process, reabsorption process, and secretion process within our kidneys is not functioning properly. So urine suppression is not a bladder problem like urinary retention. It's actually a kidney issue. And the third one is incontinence. Um, and this is involuntary micturition. Basically, during incontinence, what happens is we, um, as we get older, lose the control over the um, external sphincter muscles. And for whatever reason, they spasm, which prevents us from holding on to the um, urine inside of our bladder. All right, so what we need to take a look at now is our three different diagrams here. And the first one really doesn't have a lot on it. This is actually more of a let's get oriented to how all of these pieces and parts are um, put together here. So let me get my, okay. All right, so. What we see here, you can see we have the aorta coming down, um, and right next to it is the inferior vena cava. Now, um, both the aorta and the inferior vena cava tie into the kidneys. Basically, as the blood comes down through the aorta, it is going to go into, left or right, into the kidneys through what we call the renal artery. The blood goes into the kidney, gets filtered, undergoes reabsorption, um, and then the urine is secreted. The clean blood then comes out of the kidney by the renal vein and directly into the inferior vena cava to return up to the heart. Now, after the kidney produces the urine, the urine actually empties down into these tubes that lead out of the kidney, which are the ureters. So you have one coming from each kidney, and the ureter, why is that still there? sure why that still is there, sorry, leads down to the bladder where we collect the urine and then at the very end here coming out, oops, coming out of the bladder is the urethra and that leads to the outside. Okay. So again, this is just kind of an overview of those so that you can kind of see how everything is arranged. Notice here that we have the rectum. So the kidneys are actually back along your spine, and as the ureters come down, they're actually also moving forward towards your belly button. So that by the time they reach the bladder, the bladder is actually ends up being in front of the rectum. Um, and you'll see this on the pig in that the, the kidneys are actually buried back towards the spine of, of the pig. Okay, so the next one we're going to look at here is a longitudinal cut of the kidney. And this is a little cartoonish, but quite honestly, when you actually dissect the um, kidney on Tuesday, I think it is, or in class, um, you will actually see that this does look very much like what um, the kidney looks like. Okay, so you see in here we have the blood coming in through the renal artery, and remember the clean blood is coming out through the renal vein. So we're going to work from the outside 
in on this diagram. And we're actually going to start over here with this line. This is kind of like the rind, if you want to think of it, of the kidney. It's kind of like the peel. And this is what we call the renal capsule. Basically, it helps keep all of the tissue within the kidney contained. Now, the outer layer, kind of here, is actually represented by this line here. And that is the renal cortex. So it's the space kind of above these like feathery looking things here. These feathery looking things are located within the renal medulla. And so these are the renal or sometimes they're called medullary pyramids. I prefer the term medullary because it tells you what layer that they are in. Now, the space in between these medullary pyramids is labeled there, and that is called the renal column. Now, each renal pyramid, and you can kind of see, they're, they're kind of triangle shaped, sort of, okay? They drain into this area here, which is called the calyx. And you have the major calyces, you have the minor calyces. So basically the minor calyces are smaller, and then they combine to create the major ones. And eventually they get down into this center area here where they all feed into, which is referred to as the renal pelvis. The renal pel pelvis is kind of at this indent here in the kidney, which is called the hillis. So that's the anatomy of the kidney itself. Our last diagram is actually going to take a look at the nephron. And the nephrons are found within the um, renal, pier or renal uh, medullary pyramids. Sorry. <laughs> All right, and we do have some numbers on here. So what I'm going to do just for the sake of space is I'm going to um, kind of write these off to the side. So number one here on your diagram is the Bowman's capsule. And you can see it kind of has this cup-like shape around this curly Q stuff, which is the glomerulus. That is the high pressure kidney that filters the blood. So you can see the, the capillary comes in and it literally pushes everything into this cup and then the materials then drain all through these tubules here. Now we are going to cross off number two. We are going to cross off number three. We are going to cross off number four and we are going to cross off number five. Okay, as well as number eight and number nine. Basically six if you look at the direction, okay, this blood has to flow in this way and up this way. It is an artery, and seven is a vein because it's bl uh, blood that is coming then from the um, capillary network that actually lies over the top of that. Oh, I'm sorry, number two is not the glomerulus. That's number 15. Sorry. I just looked at my list. <laughs> all right, so basically we've jumped all the way down to 10. Um, but I actually want to kind of go back. So we've got 15 here is the glomerulus. So the blood uh, gets filtered here at the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. And the combination of these two is the renal corpuscle. So when you're talking about the renal corpuscle, you're co talking about the combination of those two structures. Now the urine is then going to um, start traveling through the tubing. 
all right? And the first tube that it's going to hit is actually number 13. Number 13 is the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal refers to the distance it is from the renal corpuscle. So this is the near end of the tube closest to the renal corpuscle, so that's why it's the proximal. All right. It then travels, and you can see it kind of winds around here, and then it makes this dip. This dip is actually down towards the center of the kidney. And as you go down towards the center of the kidney, you actually increase the pressure. So when you get down here to number 10, number 10 is the loop of Henle. So we actually have some special processes that need to take place within the kidney um, under these special pressurized conditions, and the loop of Henle allows that reabsorption and secretion to actually happen. As I follow the tubule back up, it kind of twists and winds around here till we get to number 12, which is the distal convoluted tubule. Remember, distal because it is the furthest part of the tubule that is away, or furthest part of the tubule from the renal corpuscle. And if you follow that around, then it, it matches up or it joins up with this structure. And you can see I have a lot of other or distal convoluted tubules that are adding in. That joins number 11, which is your collecting duct. So this would feed in and eventually go to a ma minor calyx, turning into a major calyx, and then down into the pelvis. That leaves number 14. And 14, you can see we've got a capillary bed, essentially, capillary web, that is all over the different tubules. And that is because, remember, we have all that reabsorption that has to take place, and the only place that that can happen is at a capillary. I can't diffuse into an artery or vein. So these are referred to as the paratubular, which refers to the fact that they are around the different tubes, the paratubular capillaries. Now, number 11, 12, 10, and 13, when those are combined, they are referred to in general as the renal tubule. So if you see that term, it is talking about the entire combination of all of the different tubules after the Bowman's capsule in the nephron. All right, so that finishes it up in terms of our notes for the urinary system. And we just have to take a look then at the homeostasis chart.